where does mathematics exist? Does it exist in the material world or is it a product of the experiential? Are equations like E equals MC squared discovered or are they created? This is actually a, a very old question and a greatly considered one at that. For as far back as ancient Greece, mathematics has always reserved its front row seat to our interrogations of reality. So join me as I attempt to unpick the infinities of what is. Among the Platonists, mathematics was revered, considered the highest form of intellectual inquiry, capable of leading thinkers beyond the corporeal world to a domain of eternal, unchanging truths. Inspired by the Pythagoreans, this was an ideal so ingrained into Plato's metaphysics that it was said he had an engraving above the entrance of his academy which read, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. However, Plato had a somewhat curious relationship with numbers in that he believed them to be aspects of absolute identity. Yes, they may be abstract objects, but ones that nevertheless truly existed beyond space and time, independent of any human appreciation. For Plato, all aspects of the waking world were thought to emerge as coarse representations of what should be considered their most pure ideal form, the perfect person, perfect society, or even the perfect version of the number two, forms that were said to be eternally present within reality. And so, though maths could be freely used in the functional practices of the marketplace and architecture, its deeper study became much more aligned with a mystical worldview, its own metaphysical line of inquiry best discernible through inner searchings, where one could traverse beyond the physical world so as to rediscover forgotten truths and the forms that still today await our rediscovery. But even in his own time, Plato's words were never considered absolute. In contrast to his teacher, Aristotle claimed that though mathematical objects did indeed exist, they did not need to exist within any abstract realm, since for Aristotle numbers did not proceed from perceptible things but stood in account of them. It was to take the insights of an astronomer almost 16 centuries later to truly recognise the weight in which mathematics can be a force within nature. In his own words, mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. This was Galileo's world-changing revelation. For within the complexities of mathematics, Galileo and we as a species had discovered a path by which we could indeed understand the universe. A language that gave us the ability to evoke the patterns that once lay hidden, embedded within the chaos. Here it was, the key to all things, the very signature of God. And for centuries, this has remained the relationship, as today, mathematics and our understanding of the universe continue to entwine in ever more complex dance, now fused to their very core. But even with this, key to all things, and its modern day pivot away from mystical interpretation, we are still left to question whether things are what reality is truly made of. In the modern philosophy of mathematical fictionalism, 
we are asked to consider the opposing extreme with the quite blunt suggestion that numbers might not exist at all. Numbers, they say, are no more than fictional stories, ergo all mathematical calculations are inherently false. The line of reasoning being that if there is no such thing as numbers, how could they have any universal truth? In contrast, mathematical nominalism offers a line of reasoning that may appear more rational to a modern mindset, as it suggests that numbers are neither existent abstract objects nor imaginary figments, but merely another form of language, a tool, used only to describe the things of reality. On the surface, this seems all well and good, though, as physicist Eugene Winner noted, there is still an unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. Because even though it may only be a language, there is still no justifiable reason as to why this particular language should work as effectively as it does. Winner makes the point that, quote, the enormous usefulness of mathematics in the natural sciences is something bordering on mysterious, and that there is no rational explanation for it. End quote. To the point where the efficacy of mathematics, when thought about in any great detail, is just downright scary. Because in being this incomprehensibly useful tool, it has inadvertently revealed a very deep-seated truth about our world. A truth that would strongly resonate with the Pythagoreans in that reality is knowable. But the case for the nominalists may not be as open and shut as one might first assume. For if numbers and calculations are indeed accurate descriptions of something real, how can we explain those more complex mathematical puzzles which only seem to offer up riddles of paradoxes, infinities, transcendental numbers and other answers which make no sense in our real world. Of course, any language can conjure up fantastical or nonsensical phrases, but what does it mean to have a nonsensical answer to an equation? Well, it can either mean that the answer is wrong, or it might just mean that we asked a nonsensical question. But if the question truly is a nonsensical one, does this not in itself prove another underlying truth about some aspect of reality? Take, for example, the barber paradox. If we are to say that the village barber shaves all and only those who do not shave themselves, the question is, who shaves the barber? For if he shaves himself, the initial statement is false. But if he does not shave himself equally, the statement is false. As a linguistic paradox, we can solve this simply by stating that there cannot be such a village barber. The statement has proven this to be true by proving itself false. But this happens equally with our mathematical reasoning. When a paradox or contradiction arises, this then proves to us that for some reason the equation is inherently illogical. A question that has been declared prior to its asking as unaskable. For mathematics to be correct, regardless of whether it exists, it must either agree or disagree with a truth that exists in the real world, and yet even the simplest concepts, like the harmless circle, can offer up truly profound conundrums. When Archimedes first attempted to calculate the circumference of a circle, he discovered a very peculiar and now very famous attribute of its nature. He began simply enough, placing a triangle inside of a circle. Then, stepping up from a three-sided triangle to a six-sided hexagon, he increased the number of sides, slowly filling the circle. Moving up through the 12-sided dodecahedron, going on through 24, 48, and even as far as the 96-sided hexagon, which is just another fun word. But 
regardless of how many times the sides were doubled. There was always a tiny bit left over. So, finding no sign of end to the sequence, he began working from outside in, now trimming the edges, and thus moving ever inwards towards the circle. But once again, there was no end. Though he was, eventually, able to prove that the circle's circumference could be calculated by multiplying its diameter by some still unknown number between 3.1408507 and 3.1428 He had also discovered that no matter how many steps were taken, the dividing segments would only push the answer into higher and higher decimals. What Archimedes had discovered was a number with infinite irrationality, meaning for us that both the circle's circumference and area are, and always have been, unknowable. Today we all know this as the infamous pi, and as of May 2025, it had been calculated to over 300 trillion decimal places. But nowhere within that immense number has any pattern ever arisen. But philosophically, what is the underlying truth that Pi reveals? Is it telling us that perfect circles can't exist in nature? Or is it telling us that numbers are incapable of describing them? Is it saying that the underlying nature of a circle is inevitably digital, made up of an infinite series of bits, or that the language of numbers cannot express the circle's true analogue nature? It's an interesting thought, because if we are to imagine the curve of a theoretically perfect circle, we must assume that its curve persists in equal parts around the circle's circumference, so that to remain purely analogue, its curve would need to persist at an angle that dissects reality infinitely. The concept of a perfect circle could therefore only be what Plato would consider an ideal form, something that may exist in abstract form, but only beyond the capabilities of the material world. So beyond the circle, is Pi hinting at the indescribability of an underlying infinite nature of analogue reality, or a nature of knowable, finite, calculable bits. And though the nature of a circle may seem trivial, what is a wave cycle but two halves of a circle, and waves as we know are indispensable to all things physical? So are we digital, or are we analogue? And getting back to our topic of consciousness happening within the organism, is our consciousness an attribute of the digital system we call organism, chased across the last few chapters, or is it an attribute of an ever-present analogue flux, whatever that might be? This being yet another very old and greatly considered question, Admittedly, this may be the conundrum that lies closest to the heart of the difficulties encountered when attempting to describe the reality we find ourselves in. And it's more than just a division between the mathematically knowable and unknowable attributes of reality. For at its core, it is a divide between two dueling perspectives, that of permanence and that of change or phrased more poetically, that of being and that of becoming. The most common understanding of the universe held in the developed world today is one arrived at through a mathematicized understanding of physics. A worldview that describes reality in terms of beings, discrete energy packets, minuscule bits of information, And these are those that participate in the becoming of the universe via a process of constant movement and change. Though this linguistic framework of parts and process can be confusing, as it often comes hand in hand with a declaration of hierarchy. For example, it's frequently suggested that these states of being 
are what nature is genuinely made of, whereas its becomingness is more about what those beings do. In quantum physics, this class of being would most commonly be attributed to the atomic bodies, from the atoms to subatomic particles, whilst the process by which they become is attributed to the fundamental constants of nature, those we call universal laws. Likewise, in astronomy, being is associated with the systems of planets, stars, nebula, and galaxies, whilst their shared field of becoming is described in terms of space-time and its influence through gravity. In biology, it's the life forms who attain the status of being, whilst once again sharing in an ever-present field of becoming, which in this instance is given as evolution. But once we take a step back and look at the patterns inherent in this dichotomy, we realise we may have got our definitions backwards. Since every single example of being just offered was always a temporary structure whose identity is in constant flux, far from any state of permanence. Whereas the fields attributed to their becoming, be they laws, physical forces, space-time or even evolution, are themselves far less subject to change. Though they may stand as a symbol for the degree by which some system can change, they are themselves, in a certain sense, unchanging, to the extent that they may even be considered eternal structures of the universe, constants of nature. In short, because we are constantly forced to frame both being and becoming contextually, we're often made to lean on their juxtaposed nature, be that the beingness of the becoming or the becomingness of any being. And atop this, there's another pattern I think we should pay special notice, which is our bottom-up preference, where systems of becoming always give rise to being, i.e. the laws are what give rise to the quanta and not the other way around. And here is where the dilemma behind our mind-body problem resurfaces. Because though this seems to be the case in every example offered, neurology appears to have this relationship turned on its head, where the being is thought to be responsible for the becoming. In respect of consciousness, it seems that we are given a description of its being and the neurons and the activities of the organism, whereas its becomingness, given in terms of psychology, let's say, is that which is said to come secondary. Now, perhaps there is a more profound thought to be considered here, or maybe not, since as before, this may merely be a problem inherited from our language and our tendency to assume hierarchy, always appreciating the noun before the verb. But in consideration of this confusion and our greater search for the bounds of consciousness, let us now ask, should we be paying our attention to the being aspect of a system or its becoming?